Good morning, gamers. I am the proud owner of a set of Blood Torva. And in this video, I'm going to be showcasing my successful fights with all four bosses, as well as a whole lot of deaths and terrible mistakes. Um, I'm going to try and run through each boss, give my thoughts on the Awakened versions, and some ideas as on, on things like tactics, things I did right, things I did wrong, things you can learn from if you're going for this yourself. And at the end of this video, I'm going to switch into a ramble style video on DT2 in general. Uh, what awakened content like this means in terms of difficulty and aspirational sort of uh, outlook for players. And just everything DT2. Been very active on Twitch, and thank you everyone if you've been watching the streams because they've been insane. Um, but I'm going to take some time at the end of the video for that. So for now, let's dive into breaking down some of these awakened bosses, the differences, uh, the gear, and just, again, everything that goes into making them what they are. So for starters, Vardorvis. The first thing you'll notice that's different is that I'm getting hit on spawn with axes. This means you cannot stand in the edge areas where the axes spawn, and instead you have to find some mechanism to dodge them or to position yourself so that you won't be hit. The grid that I have on the ground is, a, is one of my own making, um, and it's very, very effective, but there are some drawbacks. The red tiles were initially my useful tiles, but in Awakened bosses versions, those tiles are not safe from the axe's spawn, and you can see me step away from them at the start here. And if I don't like that, I get hit. So you have to be very careful. When axes spawn on you, they will not bleed you, but they will deal instant singular damage. So you have to be quite careful to move away from those red markers if you're using these. Now, the other thing you'll notice here is that there are four axes instead of three. And the things that spawn from the ground, uh, there is a range and a mage one. The mage one is like a bit more of a wave. The range one is like a bit of a cone. You can see that sometimes one spawns, sometimes two spawns. Um, and it can be very, very overwhelming. If I, had to, if I had to choose one thing to describe all these fights, it would be overwhelming, to be honest. So you'll see it very often. I'm just stuck trying to brew, trying to get back to a stable position. Um, and a lot of the time you'll see tons and tons of combo food being eaten or lots and lots of frantic clicks. Uh, and honestly, I'm not a fan of just overclicking and doing stuff like this, but it's just really difficult. Uh, there's not much you can do other than that in some cases. So at the, end, at the end of the day, you have to survive. You have to survive. So in addition to the, all this stuff, the boss's defense and stats, uh, they are like twice as high, I believe. I don't think the defense is twice as high, but the HP seems to be, and so does his damage, as well as all damage in the room seems to be approximately twice as high. So you have to be very careful with your prayers. Um, this attack here has a smaller window. If you are too late, you will take some large damage. Um, and I think that is actually everything for Vardorvis. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but together between the double damage, between the combination prayers, which will also turn your prayers off momentarily, uh, between the axes that hit you on spawn, there's a lot going on here and it's a lot to juggle. Now, there is a technique for skipping, quote unquote, the axes. And a lot of players are doing this. Personally, I didn't want to do this. I think it wasn't quite true to the nature of the challenge, but it's not to take away from the players who are doing it. It's still a completely valid method. Uh, and it really is up to you on whether you think you would like to try it and make it work, because it also has its drawbacks and it has its own timings. Um, and that's all, you know, that's all fine as well. So if you, I, I'm not going to put out something on it because I didn't do any of it. But if you watch other clips or you get some ideas on Twitch, or I'm sure there'll be plenty of other videos out, if you're looking for a slightly more timing-based method, consider having a look at the axes skips because it will make this a decent chunk easier and will probably be worth learning in the long run, especially if you're having great struggles here. So that's about all the methods and stuff. Uh, that's kind of the fight breakdown. I don't think there's much to be done in terms of being able to really solve this any further. I think that you either have to choose to axe skip and perfect axe skipping, or do something like this and play very carefully with the tiles you're given. Um, either way, very, very, very cool fight, one of my favorites. This one took about 25 attempts, and it was the first boss I attempted. I went in blind. This was entirely my own effort, so very, very, very happy with this one. Um, and yeah, the end was crazy. I, I, I had to play quite carefully with like one brew for 10% or more, so... Yeah, let's move on to Duke as the next boss. So, Duke is an endurance match. 
this boss has a stupid amount of HP, and it only really gets difficult towards the end. So I was asking very early on with regards to Duke in chat whether or not this boss was more difficult or more easy since other players had started with different bosses, and the overall consensus was that it wasn't really more difficult or more easy, it was a different kind of difficult. Um, and this is very true because of the endurance nature of the fight, um, because of everything that goes into getting there, and then also the mechanics that are thrown at you. Uh, it's very, very interesting. So at the start here, the difference to begin with is that you need three sets of mushrooms at level 99. Uh, I think if you're getting five, you're going to need more. So you need to make 18 of each total. And this start is identical. This does count for the kill. You still have to do it. You've got to brew three potions in total. Uh, so a bit annoying already, but that's just what it is. Uh, I think these vents on the ground fire a bit more frequently, but I'm not certain. It doesn't really matter leading up to the start of the kill. And the best in-slot weapon here is 100% Fang, and also Void Waker for special attacks. I think there are some other options with regards to using some of the new rings, especially the ones that give slash accuracy, and that's probably also true for the, um, the other boss of Ardorvis that we just did. But I didn't have access to any of these things. I didn't want to splooge money on them because I think they're going down. So this is just with like no new rings. Thralls, thralls are also good for both. And I think in general, like all the bosses, thralls do very well. And uh, a similar inventory setup as well. So this fight starts very similarly. Um, spend, send our Void Wakers, get on Fang. And you'll notice it's very similar to a normal kill. Duke is a 5-tick NPC, and you have to flinch it, which means you have to be in melee range to generate a melee attack. And if you do this, then you'll take minimal chip damage and be able to dodge the large damage. This attack works identically, um, and it'll come up a bit more frequently. So you just have to dodge behind the pillar and do it on a good timing. So that also works the same. The big difference with Duke mechanics for Awakened versions is that the vent acid that goes on the vents... Up until around 78%, I think it's it's not very precise. Some people were getting it at like 78, 75, 73%. So it may just be sub 80. But I think around around 75%, Duke will start throwing two acid pools out towards these vents. And as you can see here, we're on 77% and he throws out one. It's important to note that you need to go back into the melee range of Duke after he throws out acid at these pools in order to make sure that you're generating melee attacks because if he throws out more then if you stand sorry if he doesn't throw out more and you stand far away you can be maged so you have to try and get back into melee here we're at 71 percent and he's going to throw out four what we do is we move directly back to not rag the middle vent and this is really important to the overall fight is to not rag that middle vent because this gives you more walking space and you're going to need it later so you need to react to seeing him throw out stuff and then move directly back and you'll see me doing this a few times throughout this fight um, here we go, so we move back, path directly over, and we can path over any of these three in a line, and then back into Duke to get the hit. Um, and this is where it gets very important, is that when we hit 30%, I think it might be 25%, but 25% um, is in Rage, and 30% generates a black orb like the Acker Room, um, which will follow you around. It's it's not not quite follow you around, but it will. Um, it's like the one from the, the Acker Path, where it will come towards you from either side. That's a 30% and 25% is in Rage. What in Rage means is that Duke goes from 5 tick to 4 tick and you have to start basing things off a 4 tick cycle. Uh, sorry if I'm getting like kind of technical for this, but this is the kind of level of gameplay where you have to be a bit technical to describe it. Uh, and it's the only way I can really give hints and ideas. So if you're just watching to like know the bosses and don't care about this stuff, I'm sorry, but um, it's tricky enough that you have to consider it. So here you can see I mess up and I bring uh, I bring the acid around and therefore I'm taking quite a bit of damage. You'll notice I'm also wearing a Slayer Helm, and the Slayer Helm will reduce the vent damage by 50%, so I do think it's pretty valuable, although not required. If you're good enough and you're confident enough to do it with Torva Helm, Torva Helm would in theory be better. But um, I think due to mistakes and uh, bad pathing, the Slayer Helm is a nice sort of uh, decent help here. So what we're doing is we're still adding all these acids, acid things to the back, we're still doing the melee flinch, we're still dodging, dodging stuff, and occasionally I will receive acid trail a bit like all. I think this lasts for anywhere from 14 to 16 ticks, I'm not exactly sure, but it's about three attacks worth and then it will stop. I got fairly lucky during this fight to not have acid too much, but 
here we go, here's the first one. And you have to remember to path back in and still dodge the melee. I don't recommend attacking unless you're attacking on the exact tick, and instead walking along the front left and right while you're waiting for the attack to generate is a much better strategy to not take acid damage. It's a fairly simple mechanic where you simply can't stand on the acid you've generated on the ground, so being careful to make sure that you are dodging it but also leaving yourself enough free tiles at the front here is key. If that other vent was covered and I had acid, this would be a lot more difficult as you can see I'm parting towards the middle now, and if the vent was covered I'd be taking a hell of a lot of damage. So we're approaching 30% here and the next mechanic is due. The next mechanic is going to be the black orb. This thing deals 25 damage and appears from either side. And it's a bit of a nightmare because sometimes you just have to tank it. You can see here I'm trying to dodge it and uh, in doing so I rag a vent. And this is really bad if I get acid. Um, turns out I'm lucky. So you can definitely have a little bit of luck involved with regards to what mechanics come through. And as you can see here you can skip those orbs. They are directly copied from Akka. Um, as far as a mechanic goes, they, they share the same principle, you can still run over them. Same goes for the acid walk, it's a bit like Alm. So these are very familiar mechanics, which helps a lot. Um, and you can always, if you've got experience in those other places, you can transfer some of those skills. Now, as we approach 25%, which is Duke's Enrage in Awakened Versions, you'll notice that his attack speed goes from 5 ticks to 4 ticks. Here I didn't move properly and I take a big mage hit. This thing can hit up to 60, I think. Uh, his regular melee on prey is like 40. Uh, it's a lot of damage. Again, everything here is doubled in stats and HP and everything. And you'll also notice after vents there, I made sure to attack a tick earlier. So because Duke has gone from 5 tick to 4 tick for this fight, you have to be coming back from the vents here a bit earlier. So I have to attack now, and if I attack the tick later, like I was earlier, I would be hit. So... Um, up until the end of this fight, now that it's gone to 20 25%, the mechanics remain the same, and all I have to do is continue to not direct too much of the room, get my hits in early, and make sure that I am going back in melee range to generate the melee hits while dodging. Um, it's a lot to juggle, but I think Duke is considered the second easiest fight, so it's not as bad as uh, Vardorvis, and it's not as bad as specifically Leviathan, which I think is the trickiest for a variety of reasons. And of course, I'm going to cover that in some depth because it's really interesting. Um, at this point, uh, I, I think I was trying to just sort of get in the zone and really just play it out. Um, this is one of those bosses where this is probably the only boss where I really didn't think about using more Void Waker specs. I really didn't really know what was going on. I was just playing the game. And that's about as good as I could have done, I think, given the circumstances. So very close chance at the end here. Playing as best you can for this length of time is going to generate these mistakes. Well, this is what our combo food is for. And uh, Duke being on 5% here, I think we just about managed to clutch up. So this boss, I think, took approximately 15 orbs. But the length of the fight is extremely long. So I think I took a bit more time on Vardorvis overall. But uh, honestly, I was, just, I was just surprised that I even killed it because I wasn't really aware of its HP. I was just like going after it. So there's Duke. Uh, a lot more interesting and in-depth mechanics and... Um, definitely a lot more to the fight than Vardorvis, although I still think Vardorvis is my favorite because of the direct dodging aspect. So, let's make a move and we're going to do the Whisperer next. Okay, here we are. This is the Whisperer fight and uh, the gear is pretty much the same as you would bring to a normal fight. I didn't mention this before, but it's important to note that none of these guys' defense levels can be reduced in Awakened versions, so any defense reducing weapons are not useful. Uh, in addition, things like, in general, most spec weapons probably are less useful outside of ZCB Void Waker. Um, and while you could probably fit a ZCB in here, it doesn't really matter because you're so strong with magic anyway. Whisper is definitely the easiest of the three, and most people seem to agree great, greatly on this one. Um, Kirby actually managed to one and done this without looking at any eyes or anything. I think this took me four attempts. Um, two of them, I ended up taking too much damage and going insane. The insane thing is the bar on the top left, and if you take damage or you fail mechanics, you are going to increase that bar, and if it reaches 0%, you are going to die. Just, you are going to die. You take massive chip damage over time. So you can still freeze this boss in awakened modes. Um, the big thing that changes immediately is the attack pattern. It goes from 3 to 5, 
And these things on the ground attack from all directions and in some slightly different patterns, which you have to learn to dodge. I will say that um, if you are trying to go for awakened KCs, you are not going to struggle on this boss. Um, now, my method for doing pillars was to take a screenshot, and that's what you can hear in the background. This is a very popular method and something that players do at hard mode TOB and TOB to do speedrun solos due to the nature of just the difficulty in remembering things and not having to therefore mark tiles. You simply don't have the time to do it here, so you can either remember or take a quick screenshot and refer to it to do it correctly. Um, I have a terrible memory and a terrible time learning this, so I opted for that version and it worked pretty well. Although it's a bit awkward, it's still uh, very useful. The method for doing this would be to use Imgur via ShareX, which is a brilliant and very quick screenshot program. So um, this boss isn't too crazy. I do recommend one thing, which is to bring a heart and use the heart before you enter. About two, like as soon as you start potioning to enter this room, use the heart. And then during the kill, if you ever take damage, you can always combo eat with brew and continue to use the heart uh, again, middle of the fight. So it will give you a bit of an ability to combo eat if required. For these ghosts, they spawn a lot more of them. And you have to use a combination of Venetabo and Blowpipe, I believe, in, or in order to do this. There may be some method with purely piping it that allows you to do it tick perfect, but as I have access to a Venetabo, I didn't try it, and I don't know many people who have done it without. Um, I don't even know if you have to kill all of them, but obviously we could do here, and there's a good window to do so. Um, as far as the other mechanics go, there are two sets of every attack. So instead of one set, there's two sets. There's two sets of ghosts, two sets of pillars, uh, two sets of orbs that you have to run, and all of them are the same patterns as they are in the regular versions, although the orbs do swap patterns. I do think you can get attacks off here and still make it in time, um, so if you want to, you can, but it's not a big deal. It is an endurance fight and you have to take it kind of slow, but if you do, then it'll be okay. The melee hits extremely hard, 42, 40 here, 42 here, made a mistake. Um, and I combo 8 with my brew, because my heart is only like 40 seconds from cooldown now. So ideally don't make the mistake in the first place, but if you do it's not the end of the world. This is another new attack on the ground now, this one isn't seen in the regular version, um, and you have to dodge two tiles away and not one tile away. So it's a nice little uh, sort of mix up to make it so players move a bit further and are a bit more aware. Um, this is the second pillar phase, and as you can see, I didn't, I didn't at first going into this suspect a second pillar phase, so it was stupidly confusing, but um, yeah. I think you can also afford to take one hit from the pillars here, although it's still going to be detrimental if you do. Um, but I think you can afford to take one hit, and you're not going to go insane randomly from just one hit. You'd have to make multiple mistakes. The insanity bar is very key to this fight. Um, what you are, what you cannot do is stay in the Shadow Realm permanently for all of the specials. Because there are six of them instead of three, you will go insane. So at some point you're going to have to tap out early. You cannot just stay in there to know which ones are the pillars. Um, you have to choose between the ones you want to be on. So I suppose it's a choice between the pillars or a choice between the orbs. Um, the orbs are probably easier to do in hindsight, but that's hindsight for you. So if you are familiar with the boss patterns for the orbs, because they are the same in both both versions, take a glance and then get out of it. And then if you want to not do some screenshot tech, then it would be easier to simply uh, do the mechanics normally. This ghost thing, I did blow by these guys um, and I should have venited, I believe. So turns out it's still okay even piping, which was expected. And I think you have time as long as you're on time. But uh, Venator cleans up here. And as you can see, boss is not quite there, so... I think there was definitely time here. Um, and again, I don't know. Whisper is definitely the easiest of the fights. As you can see, there's not really a whole lot different. The flicking pattern is a little bit strange at times, but it's not crazy. I think the boss damage is not also that high. It's probably around about um, 30s from these attacks instead of 20s. So it doesn't feel as if it's a double damage and hits 40s. Maybe in the Enrage it does. So maybe in the Enrage, but that's that. Uh, to be honest, I think that's pretty much everything from this fight. Uh, the only thing to look at now is the Enrage. The difference for the Enrage is that it attacks with Mage first from my run, 
I don't know if it's random, but for me it was Mage first to switch it up, and it usually starts range in the regular version. So it started Mage, and it alternates every attack. Um, which is only a little bit more difficult, it's not really that much worse. You can react to the attacks directly, so it's not actually that bad at all. And you just need to move and path, and don't stay in the same area. I don't think that's the best play. Uh, and that's really it. You notice at the end of this as well, the attacks actually just alternate as well, which is surprisingly quite nice compared to a sort of a two on, two off, and one at the end. So, yeah. Here's the second pillar phase. I actually thought, I don't know if this is the third pillar phase. Maybe it is. Uh, I really thought there were only two. Maybe I'm going crazy. Uh, <laughs> I got like 12 hours sleep last night. So, not 12 hours. I, I, I played for like 12 hours in the day and then 12 hours, 13 hours day before getting like five hours sleep so i'm a little bit loopy right now but yeah um but i think this will be the last special leading up unless there's like one more orb phase maybe um but yeah overall not too crazy so that's all the mechanics from this boss i can talk a little bit for a couple minutes about um some of the other stuff that went on i did manage to pick up the butch pet which is the pet from vardorvis at i think 43 kc which is really cool so I managed to snag one of the four pets. I think what I'm going to be doing for the next few streams uh, starting next week or maybe Sunday is probably going to be hunting the remainder of the pets. Uh, the more I do the bosses, the more they grow on me. I think I, I do actually really like all the encounters. Even Duke. I'm going to say I think I even like Duke, poor guy. Um, he's not the best, but there are, there are some tactics to make it pretty easy and speed up the prep, so it's not too bad at all. Um, I can't believe I'm saying it, man. I, 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 the first thing I did when I entered Duke was just complain and leave when DT2 was released, and I didn't want to do it. But now having an understanding of the cycle, having, having a better understanding of the mechanics, Duke's not that bad. Um, awkward as he is, he's not that bad. You can see here, uh, she's attacking with a different style every attack, uh, just alternating, and there are three of these things, two to three of these things on the ground that you have to be wary and look out for. I think if you're using a shadow here, um, it's really not that bad at all. I guess I took like maybe one hit. So that's about all you can take. My sanity bar went down to like 14%. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful not to take too many hits. And it is a DPS race ultimately, but certainly doable. The easiest of the four bosses. And let's move on to the last one. It's Leviathan to finish us off. Incidentally, this is also the order I did the bosses in. So I chose to do Leviathan last, having three out of four, because Leviathan was considered the hardest from what people were saying. Uh, I think I lived to regret this a little bit, but um, too late to take it back now. Let's jump in. Okay, it's number four of four. It's Leviathan. Let's jump in. Um, this boss caused me headaches beyond belief. This boss, um, you can improve greatly from having a good range of tactics that you build up and utilize and some good methodology with regards to how you approach specials. I think there's a lot to juggle here. And you have to have good uh, sort of mental awareness on what you want to do and how you want to do it. In order to get this KC, you have to, you have to learn some of these methods as well. You can't just jump in and place rocks and hope that it's gonna work. The first thing is that it's gonna attack faster and build up a bit faster. Um, as you can see here, this is about as fast as you want it to go. After this point, you want to come into close range melee and shadow barrage it, making sure to keep the melee prey on to try and catch any melees that it might throw at you, which are going to hit like 80. And then this mechanic is the same, although you have a one or two tick smaller window to do it. Notice that the boulders, uh, they land in big, bigger rock falls around you at the end of each phase. And this boulder phase, I think, is the same, where it lands 10 total boulders and you have to dodge at the end. This mechanic hits anywhere from 60 to 80, something like that. So it's a good amount if you don't take the damage, but it is tankable. There are methods to stack these rocks. Um, I definitely, out of the four bosses, my weakest was definitely Leviathan with my approach. Uh, I, I have so many regrets from this boss, to be totally, totally honest. I will get into them and try and explain them to learn from them and show you guys what I did wrong so you guys don't make those mistakes. But um, first of all, boulder management is important. And when he throws out boulders, what you can do is move and attack, move and attack. You have two ticks per boulder and you can stack them. So instead of having one boulder in a row, you can have two. 
I never ever did this throughout my runs, knowing about it was fine, I may have done a couple of attacks but not intentionally tried to stack them. I highly recommend trying to stack them and finding good tiles, um, anything from Kirby on his stream or on his YouTube when his video comes out will have information about doing that, but a lot of players you'll see on Twitch will have tiles which you can nab from their stream chats. Um, as far as tiles go, I am going to try and leave a paste bin for each of the bosses with regards to tile markers, specific plugins and things that I think will help in the description. So if you're looking for anything like that, I will attempt to update this video as best I can with all those things. So it won't be fully encompassing, but it will be a good idea. Uh, it will be a good idea of everything that's that goes on. Now, um, as far as lightning attack goes, this idea of like moving back and forth across the front row works very well. Um, again, I'm just not very good at deciding how to make it work with regards to the timing and where to start from, so I take a lot of damage from lightning. But it's not the end of the world if you tank even 50, 60, 70, 80 damage from it once or twice. You have a lot of supplies here, and a really perfect kill is not going to use up all that much. With regards to my gear choice and all that, I will mention that my hood is actually a Missouri hood, it's just transmogged. The Menifite Remedy is the blue potion in the inventory, and the purpose of this potion is that it restores your stats a bit like a restore does every 15 seconds. Um, it will not give you a boost, but if you use the Menifite Remedy, then a boost, if you end up brewing down at any time, uh, it will help you get back to full stats faster, which is very beneficial. This method here for starting the electric is really good, um, and it's quite important to try and not take too much damage from lightning. So this thing spawns at 50%, and it will follow you for the duration of the fight. It is a Verzik slash CG tornado in how it functions, and it will deal 50 damage or something like 45 damage if it hits you. If it hits you, it will despawn and respawn after about 4 to 5 ticks. So it's not one of those things where you can just tank it and have done with it. You actually have to really work with it or try not to tank it for the longest period of time. It's really important to note that when this thing spawns, after one phase of attacks from Leviathan, you Shadow Barrage instantly, because dodging this while flicking on a two-tick cycle and trying to attack, and then getting ready for a Shadow Barrage, is extremely difficult. And this was definitely a mistake I was making throughout a lot of the fight, was letting it get to the next phase. Um, and instead, towards the end of my kills, I was wisening up a little bit and trying to make sure that I was very much only letting it get through one phase and not multiple. As you can see here, this is what it looks like if you get to this stage, and instead of attacking, I find myself running around a lot, and it's very awkward. One of the big things here is to make sure that at the end of a phase, when he drops those four boulders, you drop them on the edge of the arena. Because if you don't, you're going to clutter yourself, and it will result in you having to be too close to Leviathan at the end of the fight during Enrage, and you will get meleeed and die. Probably about 20 of my attempts getting to Enrage, I died to melee due to bad boulder placement, due to lack of tactics and mechanics with boulder placement, and this honestly cost me very dearly. Now, Enrage begins at 20%, and the orb is going to spawn on the north or northeast, northwest or northeast. The idea behind trying to do Enrage is that you have to drag this tornado towards the south side and move clockwise around the boss. This will bring you to the northwest and be able to move to the northeast with the tornado trailing you from the southwest leading up to north. And this means that you're not going to take too much damage. As you can see here, once this set of rocks comes out and I'm trying not to bring it too close to the boss, I take the attack I think, or take the main tornado maybe, it's, this is okay, it's like 40 damage, and then I'm it's at 20% exactly. So boss is at 20% and I'm offing the boss. What I'm doing is I'm getting to full HP and I'm moving around to the east side. This mechanic is like stolen from Port Kazard, so thank you whoever uh, told me he was doing it, but this is super useful. You stun it on the east side and you run directly west, leading the tornado to the south, and then you proc it here with the attack on the back to guarantee it, and then move into this orb. This orb activates after four ticks and moves at walking pace, so you can blowpipe walk it, and at the end here, you uh, need to just stay in it permanently and try and dodge as best you can. It is important to flick. It is really crazy, but really important to flick, and you need to not be in melee range. Melee range will be the death of you. Let's fucking go. So, I'm actually going to show this one more time and try and break this down, because there's one more thing I need to explain about this, which is something I was not doing until the final kill. 
and it was the thing that pushed me over the edge and allowed me to get the KC. So let's just jump back a little bit and have a look at this one thing. So this final thing that is incredibly important at Leviathan, which I think is so important to remember and be aware of, is that this attack here, if you are trying to visually acquire the orbs and flick based on, on what it looks like, you're going to die. This is one of those things where there are distinct sounds, and he only does range and mage. There is no melee involved here. And so the thing that pushed me over the edge and was able to get let me get this KC was the fact that I was flicking this based on sound, and therefore not having to look at the orbs. I am going to be kicking myself over this for many, many months, because it was such a simple thing to be aware of and understand, and I made a grave error of judgment trying to visually flick them which is how I was trying to visually flick everything in this boss. Um, I had simply thought that that was how I should do it because that's how I'd done the rest of the boss. But that final part is a place where you will simply be overwhelmed with the movement, the attacking, um, the dodging, the prayer flicking. So I think that's a really key tip for anyone trying to go for this. Flick it based on sound. It will help tremendously. Um, so those are my four fights. Um, honestly, just super, super fun. I haven't had as much fun in this game since trying to go for Inferno and maybe some of the speedruns in the game. Um, first cape, that is. And I think the whole process, again, took around 90 orbs and around 9 hours. I imagine a player with up-to-date methods on this, uh, who has had practice and done 100 KC of each of the boss, maybe, uh, someone in a position who has all the resources at hand, super good gamer, I would say that it is reasonable to complete all of these Awakened bosses in around about 50 orbs maximum. Minimum 25 orbs. I don't think anyone is capable of doing this in under 25 orbs, but you never know. There are some incredible players out there. Uh, all it takes is for them to try and give it a go. You never know. So... Very interesting to see uh, what different kill counts, or what, what different orb usage counts players will require to have for this. I think the minimum I've seen right now is around about 65, 70 maybe. But I'm sure players will bring it down over time as, as more resources come out and more information and just more examples of the fights are shown. So hopefully, I mean, th this might help people bring it down by one or two orbs average, you never know. As people make more of these videos or more tactics emerge, then a couple more each time. For what it's worth, the orbs are, I think, around about 2 mil right now. I don't expect them to climb much higher than 2 mil, purely because the amount of players who are both capable of this and want to go for it um, are not that high. I think I've said a few times now that I think by the end of this year, there will be less than 200 players with Blood Torba, which is an incredibly small amount of players. Um, I'm going to extend that to 250, I just as a, just a, a, a feeling that maybe that'll be the amount. Some players have said a thousand. I haven't seen anyone say more than a thousand players by the end of the year. And to be honest, I think a thousand is too many. So we'll see. And you never know. Over time, a lot of people are going to get it. More are going to trickle into the game every single day. But it's uh, I think I think only the only the players that are like truly at the top of their game and are really 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 mechanically. Um, they have just incredibly good mechanics can even get it and a lot of a lot of those players are people who already have it now uh there's just a limited supply of those players is what it comes down to also notice the axe hit from vardorvis there that was a 90 axe hit which was kind of just ridiculous um i'm gonna leave you guys off here with a little bit of the stream commentary while i make some blood torba and show you guys what it actually looks like in game yeah. Okay, you can, you can just use it. Oh my god, that I really... Okay, I'm gonna make everything. Okay, it should be raining blood. Raining blood would be incredible. I think you must be able to undo this. Yeah, you can just revert it. Oh my god! Woo! Don't noble me, you rat! Now that is epic. Okay, what does it do? It looks you good! You look like you would make a mean pizza with that. What do you mean? What does it do? It looks amazing! That's all it does? This item is super cool. I think a lot of people think that it's a bit, um... Old school, not like old school rinse yet, but like very old school cool. 
It's red and flary, it's dark. But I like it, man. Can we get GM Slayer Helm? Yeah, I'll, I'll do some. The ultimate flex in the game right now. I've got a pet along the way, so we'll we'll use Butch. Where'd my Torbiga? You look like you could make a mean sure. pizza with those arms. <laughs> Unironically, can I uh, help you through? Why was I still. I'm gonna kick myself over this for like weeks now. Why was I not flicking based on sound? It's actually you gonna. It, like you that make one thing is gonna annoy me for like weeks and weeks now. I feel so stupid for not doing that. It's actually unreal. You look like you would make a <sighs> mean okay. pizza with those arms. Nothing I can do now. Nothing I can do now. <laughs> I think it's a tiny bit bulky, I guess, but with the helmet fits. I don't think the Zuck Slayer Helm does it justice, honestly. I don't think Zuck does it justice. You look like you would make a mean pizza with those arms. And dude. If you made it this far in the video, firstly, thank you very much for watching and listening to me, listening to me being uh, just a bit of a ramble bot. Um, it has been uh, a ton of fun going through all this, and to finish up, I wanted to talk a little bit about DT2, uh, just as the overall release goes, not so much the Awakened stuff. Just training some agility here, trying to get my agility pet. And I want to talk a little bit about how I think this is probably one of the most successful releases in the history of the game. I think it is themed well, it is built well, uh, the dev team has done a, an amazing job making sure there is like pretty much zero issues and bugs in the game. Arcane, Mod Arcane especially, I might have mentioned, but he's done a ridiculous job getting some of these bosses, leading them, and building the Awakened versions. And um, there's a lot of people on the team who in the background are pushing for this style of content and have been trying to make it a reality for a long time. It's not just the efforts of any one person on that team, it's a whole lot of people who are making this happen. So props and... Um, Really credit where it's due in this case, the team went far above and beyond what was both necessary and the, 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 the sort of the deliverance on this content has been pretty much perfect. Um, DT2 bosses, as far as they go, I'll start with Vardorvis and make my way down. Um, the mechanics at play are also incredibly unique and really interesting. The on-screen clicking little thing is like super unexpected. I, I personally didn't think this was something that you could even do and to know that there's mechanics like that that we didn't actually think were possible with the game engine that they that we can now engage with opens the door to really being a bit more creative with it and understanding there are even more things like that that can potentially come into play uh, and that's exciting on its own because for the longest time we haven't had a new style of mechanic and i know it's just an on-screen clicker but it's the first iteration and just how like what I'm doing right now, Sepulchre is kind of like the pinnacle of how to path and everything that goes into making movement work. It's you know maybe not the pinnacle, but it's like it's right up there. And, and when Old School was released, no one would have ever thought something like Sepulchre would come into play either. So it really opens the door for a whole lot of really cool mechanics to to come into hand, um, and that's that's just like awesome on its own. Bardorvis, um, outside of that particular mechanic. The actual boss fight, the windows are very tight. I love the dodging aspect. I think it's built very well, and it's sort of crafted um, with each each of the boss encounters, not just Vardorvis, but each is, each is crafted with a distinct playstyle in mind. And that's really awesome as well to see that they're taking the time to create very distinct but very fun encounters in their own in their own ways. Um, Whisperer, a bit drawn out for my liking. I do think that it's the one boss that could do with a slight decrease to its HP, but other than that, I mean, I, I have no complaints really. Um, I think that the actual mechanics, again, are very good. I'm glad that we're getting some use out of things like Venator Bow, but also not forcing it at the same time. I think the pillar mechanic is unique, um, has a different sort of... It's, it's a different way of doing the, the memory game that still works very well, and the orb also takes into account some pathing. Um, and let's not even, you know, not, not to skip by the fact that the base attacks themselves are just really, really fun to engage with. They have this awesome feel to it, which I don't think we've seen very much from other bosses before. 
Um, it's almost like... I mean, to be fair, all these bosses are sort of... What I think it's fair to say, they're new generation bosses. These are the kind of bosses we can expect going forwards, and hopefully will set a standard for what the team wants to do in terms of encounters. Um, there's certainly no need to copy all of these bosses 100%, but taking the lessons learned from them, understanding that these mechanics do play out very well and they're fun to engage with, and most importantly they feel good to play, they have a good amount of replayability, that's really good as well. Um, with regards to Duke, Duke is like a bit like Marmite, you either love him or hate him. Uh, I started by going into Duke, and on my first KC I left and didn't go back until the next day. And then I went back a few more times after some of the mechanics had been sussed out. Understanding the timing obviously helped, and just understanding the mechanics in full really helped. And I don't, I don't like Duke, but I don't dislike Duke anymore. And it took a bit for me to make that change, but I'm, I'm glad it got to that stage. So there's actually no boss that I dislike anymore. Um, I do think the potioning and stuff is not so fun, but combining a sort of semi-efficient skilling system to a bit of PVM isn't the worst thing ever. So I'm not the keenest on that, but I'm glad they limited it to only one boss, and that it only takes maybe one minute out of the fight at most. I think that's okay as it goes. And then to finish up on the boss side of things, um, Leviathan is what I actually considered to be a very janky fight initially, because of the way it was uh, for, in particular, the melee attacks. And the way this worked was that you could stand in melee range and you could flick melee, uh, and it would just melee you the whole time instead of attacking you, thus extending phases and reducing the amount of barrages required to get through a fight. And that was a bit broken and they hotfixed it or patched it out so that it was less easy to do so. And now in the current fight, you are very much forced to... Okay, can I get through this, please? Bro? Sometimes separate. Okay, I get it. I get it. Am I through? All right. Hopefully, didn't lose my train of thought. Yeah, with with Leviathan, I think I did. Uh, with Leviathan, it is very much one of those things where it's um, you know what? The train of thought is completely lost. We can blame Sepulchre for that. But the main thing is, Leviathan as a fight. Yeah, it was quite it was quite quite janky on release. It felt like to me. It felt like the least developed of the four bosses. And now, after it got patched out and the way the melee works is a bit better, um, it certainly feels much better. The more you do it, the more you get this flow to the fight that I think is... Uh, you can definitely appreciate it. So, I'm definitely happier with Leviathan now, and in order of my favorites, I would say Vardorvis remains my favorite. Um, Leviathan is probably my second favorite, tied with Whisperer. And then Duke is my least favorite, but he's not something I hate. Uh, he's just kind of Duke, you know? He's just Duke. And I think that's fine. So, overall, fantastic bosses. On to the actual loot side of things, and the system for dropping rings. This is quite controversial, and the reason they didn't really show... Um, the reason they didn't tell us how it worked, or that they were going to do it, is quite simple. I am 99% sure if they polled it, it would have failed. And after seeing a lot of the comments from players who are experiencing what it's like to play within that... Um, to like play knowing that that's how the ring drops and how it works... Okay. I, th I think a lot of people are much happier now. And it took the release to get used to it. And funnily enough, I'm at Sepulchre and I can, I can talk about it with regards to Sepulchre in the sense that... On Sepulchre release, people didn't really like Sepulchre. They thought it was too difficult and a bit unfair movement-wise. And then Husky, Husky, who created it, said to a lot of people like, just give it some time and you'll get to a, fa a place where it just kind of clicks and it feels good. And honestly, that's how it was. For me, I wasn't sure about it for two days and then eventually it just clicked and it felt really good to play. I'm really bad at this, huh? Uh, it feels really good to play now, despite my numerous errors. And um, it's in a place where it's widely accepted as a pretty fun skilling method, even if maybe the super skillers think it's a bit too good. And that's very much the case as it is going to be for, I think, the ring drops. And the question is more about whether ring drops should really be something... Sorry, the, the way the ring drops. And I'll clarify exactly how it works. But I think it's important to have a look at um, whether or not this drop mechanic should be in place in other places. 
to clarify again, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting sidetracked in this ramble part, but to clarify how the rings work, essentially you have unique drops and then you have the ring. If you roll the ring, you have to roll it three times. And on the third time you roll the ring, you receive the ring. And this seems, and if, if you, if you roll the, if you, um, if you roll the ring, you don't get a unique. Which sounds strange, but the reason for this, and it, it clicked with me the other day after someone explained it, was that if you want this to remain something where it feels like RNG and you can't track it to know how close you're getting and to sort of build up to it, this is the way to do it. Because it normalizes the distribution curve a bit more. It, it tightens the distribution curve, which is to say that instead of going extremely dry or extremely, extremely lucky, it's really, really hard to do that now. And it's very, very likely that your drop will fall within the distribution curve and not anywhere else, really. So the guy that got the ring on like 25kc is exceptionally lucky, but most players will receive their ring from like realistically 400 to 600kc, assuming it was 500kc. No one's just going to spoon in our, our 1kc ring. And, and what this really means is that it's a form of drop protection, and done in a method that disguises when you're going to get it. Um, it prevents you from going too unlucky, but also to be too lucky. So it's it's R, it's more so RNG prevention than it is uh, drop protection or some, you know something else. It's it's just about trying to normalize it a bit more and make it a bit fairer. And any time a game is pushing towards fairness in how you receive items or how you compete in content. Personally, I really like that. I think it's a huge thing um, overall for the game. I, th I think that while it doesn't have to be a system everywhere, some places, especially like this, where it's not a raid or something like that, you can afford to try it out. And in this case, I think it worked very well. And much again like Sepulchre, where people weren't sure on release, I hope that more people over time will come to see it as something that is very fair and still allows for RNG. After all, a guy got a 25kc ring, it's not to say you can't have it, but um, greatly diminishes the chance. So if you do get it early, you're even luckier if you want to put it that way, you know? Which is which is cool in its own way. Um, a lot of people are very hard stuck in their ways of understanding that, yes, old school is a very inherently drop RNG game, but there are many non-RNG elements that have crept in over the years. And I think tries trying to embrace this a little bit and let it take us forwards in the next few years for some of the drops. I think we'll see a lot more players who are actually enjoying those pieces of content seriously. Because while, let's say I was doing chambers, the chances of me spooning a Tebow aren't great. But if you do, you're very likely to like be ecstatic about chambers. But if you went dry on a Tebow, like 5,000 dry, I think that makes for a very miserable experience for a lot of players. And the question here is whether the joy of those few players who get lucky should outweigh those who are going dry and not having fun and therefore potentially burning out or not enjoying the game because of it. There's also good arguments to look at with regards to if a player is getting so lucky that they are essentially finishing content so quickly and potentially making millions of GP from a small bank because they get lucky. Like, you know how people go to TOA and from TOA they just receive a shadow within their first like 5kc at like a rate level 150. And suddenly a player whose bank level was maybe 20 mil skyrockets all the way up to 1.3 bill overnight. Um, and it's very hard for those players to decide what to do with that GP, how to spend it well, and while it's fun initially, especially for a lot of main accounts, which is the most popular game mode, that's something that is going to end up crushing their goals in the short term. And money on a main account is very, very important. So making sure that there's this level progression that is not too quick and not too slow and is likely to be at a decent pace, I think, is very important. And, and I can't stress how, how much this, this matters as far as players both enjoying the game and the health for the longevity of the game, as well as returning players not just seeing it as, oh, it's a one and done, or I have to get lucky here, and having this sort of gambler's mindset. Um, it's not as bad as real-life gambling, but it's pretty damn close as far as RNG goes in RuneScape. So, 
a, a shift away from this, and I'm, I'm, you know, it would be good, and I'm glad DT2 has introduced that. So, outside of the bosses and the rings, um, again, it's a huge thank you to the actual team itself themselves. I think they did a stellar job. Probably couldn't have delivered more. And I'm just very, very, very excited to see what's up next. Um, I'm still praying that we're going to get Blue Inferno. I don't think it's fully shelved. I really think it is going to happen at some point. And I'd love to see it with Enrage, and I'd love to see it with his drop mechanics, and I'd love to see it also be classed as aspirational content, even if it's only just like the tier above what you should be farming, you know? Just for fun. Um, something like DT2, the Awakened Bosses, I would say every one to two years is enough. One to two years. It's a really, 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 really long time. Um, but I think it's completely fine. Considering how the views of everyone was over the, over the last few days, how people have sort of come to both enjoy it on Twitch and enjoy the challenge aspect, and, re and recognize that it's not something people are farming, it is really a one-and-done guaranteed reward, and are now embracing it in a similar way to Inferno Cape. Personally, I just, I don't know. I'm super happy. I think it's awesome. Uh, I'm just very happy with the state of the game right now. Both a growing game, um, and now also catering to something I like to do, of course, but overall adding greatly to the progression of the game, and once again are sort of reinvigorating a lot of players at this level, and those who want to ultimately aspire to getting this level and obtaining these items. So, I think that's it. Ramble is over. Um, if you're here at the very end, thank you very much. There's not much more to say, really. So, um, I don't know what other content I'll be doing for DT2. I would like to put out something for the bosses, but there are a thousand more people who are much better at suited to making guide content or making just better content with regards to information outflow than I am. So I'll still be live on Twitch doing my things. I may try a couple of the Awakened bosses and see if I can get some better strategies. But um, unlike Inferno, I think this is one where it's actually too difficult to want to farm non-stop. And it costs a lot, and it costs a lot of money. So there is that. But um, I will open this chest and I will leave you guys to a wonderful day. If you're um, attempting to get Blood Torva, I wish you the best of luck. And if you're not quite there yet, treat it as a piece of aspirational content. You try and improve and get there. Treat it a bit like Infernal Cape if you haven't got it yet. And uh, it will be a ton of fun, I can guarantee it. Everyone I've talked to so far who's tried it has said nothing but good things. So, again, the best of luck to everyone on their Blood Torva adventures. Let's see if I get a pet. No, terrible game. Alright guys, take care, see you later, and bye-bye.